And TJ's love. I'm live. Wayne's oh. not live. <laughs> Wayne died. All right, everyone. What's going on, people? I'm sorry. I'm paying attention to my phone too because I want to get this on live so we can get the questions. Mm -hmm. Got another view of 43 homes today. This is the other side of it over there. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have a special guest star right here. Oh, <laughs> every time, every time, and I'm going to do it now too, so TJ, why don't you get it out of the I've way? already turned my volume down. Oh, volume down, that's a good idea. Why would we do that? So, we've got Brian here from Movement Mortgage, and today's topic is going to be lending. Um, so, any questions you have, feel free, you know the, the drill, just type away, um, you can message us. Um, private messages too, and we'll you know answer that way as well. But again, it's going to be about lending. Um, and today we're giving away a, a wine and chocolates gift card. So we have yes. a gift card and a little special surprise. So any comments and questions you have, uh, you get entered in a drawing. Yeah. You have to leave a comment or a question though. So yeah, you actually, have to. let's make it a question because yeah. I know some of you in your comments. <laughs> <laughs> Those don't count. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be particular about the comments. Yes. So. Oh, Steven's watching. Hello, Steven. Everyone waves, so he waves back. Uh, yes. <laughs> we can't see we you, We see Steven. you. <laughs> <laughs> so... How should we get started? How should we get started? Where would you like to start? No pressure. No pressure. Uh, uh, I have where we'll start. All right. Last week, um, one of our viewers asked a question, and so we've wanted to bring in Brian to answer questions about that. Um, so we'll just, you know, it's going to be out of the park right away. She had a question regarding um, student loans. Okay. How do they negatively affect pre-approval process? Is there any benefit to them? Is there not? How much damage can they cause? Um, <laughs> repair time. Yeah, we're going to get right into it. Chug, 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 chug. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the student loans, it, it, it depends on the investor. Um, so let's take since, uh, let's be simple, like for second home buyers. So with FHA, they've changed their, their guidelines where um, if the student loan is in deferred status, uh, we just need proof that it's in deferred and for how long that period is going to remain if they're in school. Uh, if they're not in school and there's no payment on the credit report, then we're going to take 1% of the balance and factor that into what's called their debt to income ratio. So loaded question, kind of trying to give yeah. you guys uh, a little bit of an angle from our side from, from what that looks. So now if you have a student loan and the payment is showing on the credit report with FHA, it's going to be based off of whatever payment is higher, the actual payment that's listed or the 1% of the total balance of the loan that's showing on the credit mm -hmm. report. So it, it, it can vary. Um, so with that being said, does it negatively impact? It could hurt, it could hurt your debt to income ratios depending on what your income level is okay. uh, or in terms of your buying power. So what that means is how much home can you really afford? So what we want to look for um, on, on a debt to income ratio is we'd like to stay between 43 and 50 percent. Okay. You get the 50 percent, now you're getting a borrower that is maybe a little bit outside um, uh, of a safety net, so to speak. Um, when Dodd Frank ruled out, that was um, uh, last October, actually a year from last October, uh, they set the matrix at 43%, but most investors, we can go 50, I've seen as high as 53, 54, mm -hmm. which at that point, I'm asking if the loan officer, what are, you, what are we really doing here? We don't want to <laughs> all over again, right? right? Um, so it, we do. Or, no, <laughs> That leads into a question. Yeah. So I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand what debt to income okay. ratio even means. So what, what that does that right. mean and how does that impact your... Great question. Okay, so the debt to income takes in the liabilities that are showing up on your credit report. So for example, um, I've got a car loan. I've got credit cards. And so those payment amounts are going to be calculated against you with what your actual gross income is. So you're gonna take the liabilities and then you're gonna have your gross income. So on a mortgage, what also factors into that debt to income ratio is what the actual mortgage payment will be, plus taxes, plus insurance. 
which is called PITI, so Principal Interest Taxes and Insurance. So the combination of your liabilities and what that mortgage payment would be and divided against your income is going to give you the factor of what is considered your debt to income ratio. So what you're saying is, so your student loan factors into those liabilities? Yes, the student loan would factor into those liabilities. So depending on what the payment is or what the balance is on the student loan could impact how much home that you'd be able to afford mm -hmm. um, uh, with the debt to income ratio on that piece. Now a lot of that could also go into, into down payment. Um, how much do you have in reserves? Uh, in terms of being able to put down on the home, which could reduce that debt to income ratio sure. as well. Sure. And, and interest rates come into play on that too. And so there's, so there's lots of different loan types out there. Yes. So you said you know, so you've seen them up to high as 53 and 54. What's the difference in the loan types? And I guess, so let's, let's back up okay. a little bit. And then let's Bring talk about down. some of the, the basic loan types that are out there for people. So right. we've got, as I know, FHA, then conventional, and VA. Correct. So let's start with, what's the difference in those, those three? All right, so you have a conventional that the investor is Fannie and Freddie, um, which Fannie and Freddie are like brother, sister. Um, Freddie likes some type of, uh, how do I say this? We'll have different guidelines for certain buyers, and, Fred, and Fannie has different guidelines for the borrowers. So as a loan officer, we have the ability to run through what's called an automatic underwriting engine, where we can kind of figure out what is the best loan Rates are pretty much the exact same, which, which investor is going to buy the paper um, is what that means. So with your conforming, your conventional Fannie Freddie, generally the minimum down payment requirement is going to be 5%. So with that said, um, you're generally looking at uh, a, a credit score. If you're at a traditional bank, probably closer to 640, 660. In the mortgage banking or uh, broker world, maybe you'll be able to go down as low as 580. Um, just depends on who the company is and whether or not they have overlays to what the investor guidelines actually state. So, um, so with the conventional, it's more of your traditional product. You're going to have mortgage insurance if you're putting less than 20% down, which when the loan actually hits a loan to value amount of 78%, the mortgage insurance will actually fall off, which I can segue right into the FHA where with the mortgage insurance, it's going to stay for the life of the loan. So your FHA products are more geared towards your, your first time home buyers. Uh, the minimum requirement is three and a half percent down. It can be gifted from a family member, um, which I should probably go back to Fannie and Freddie, but you can get a gift from them as well. Um, but it's more of your first time uh, scenario where borrowers have enough or a little bit and are getting a gift. And um, can they get a little bit lower rates because of the uh, on a conventional, rates are based off a of credit score. We're with FHA, they're more geared towards some credit score, but they're normally a little bit lower um, with, the, with the borrowers that you have because of their credit scores. Mm -hmm. The rates are a little bit less than, than a conventional. Um, how do I go into this without keeping this pretty vanilla? So with, with FHA, um, the mortgage insurance will stay on for the life of the loan, which is a disadvantage to a conventional loan. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get into special products here in a minute to kind of, there's ways to get around that. Um, but with the FHA, there was a, a big segue that just happened where the outgoing HUD chair was, had uh, in play to reduce the upfront. And then when um, the new administration came in, that was reversed right away. I'm not going to get into the, the, the political side of that. Uh, I'm going to leave it alone. But oh, please if, do. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sure we might get a lot of more about that. that. <laughs> no, but it, it, it's something where um, it really didn't have any impact. And I know, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. It, it, didn't have, it didn't really impact anyone. It, it was kind of one of those where we're all excited. And then uh, we, we kind and of lost it. So then the next product that we have is what's called a VA. So your VA loans are geared towards your veterans or um, uh, spouses of a deceased veteran. They're eligible to also get the VA benefits. So the great thing about the VA loan is that it's 100% financing. So you're generally, with your conventional, you're looking at 5% down. With FHA, you're looking at 3.5% down. With VA, it's 100% financing. And those are minimums. Minimums, minimums. correct, yeah. correct, correct. So uh, the VA is, you have a lot of veterans that, um, I'm uh, blowing up right now, excuse me. That's what happens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's a very busy 
busy, busy making. No, 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 no. no I should have turned this off. As we are very busy real estate agents. <laughs> So with the VA, you have the 100%, which is nice because you have um, a lot of veterans that aren't really aware that that product even exists right. or they don't really yeah. need to come up with a down payment. Mm -hmm. So and it's a fantastic product. It, it's a them. great product. It's insured by the VA. Um, and it's very, the VA wants to take care uh, of those that have served the country yeah. and the, the, the guidelines can be a little bit easier than maybe your traditional. Yeah. So then, yeah. So are those open to active duty or only? I, you can do active duty or you can do veterans, right? So, so what like your spouse is back home and could the spouse use a VA loan? If, so the soldier is serving yes. their, their term. We would just need to get um, a copy of their DD-214. It's okay. a form that the government, that they get issued when they go right in and when they get discharged. Mm -hmm. um, with like active that. duty, yes, the spouses uh, would have the ability. And the beauty thing with, with movement, I'm gonna do a quick plug is that if we're not sure, we can submit it to an underwriter, or we have like an underwriting hotline that we can just email and we can get all those things. So, um, if you've got any questions, give me a call and I'll leave the plug along. Okay. Um, yeah, but, you can message us or ask, and we'll be giving yeah. out information, contact information. So, right. any questions? But yeah, we've had spouses that have um, that uh, we've done financing for where their uh, the spouse is on active duty um, with being able to buy. We just okay. need to have a history. Uh, and to make the stable income. And Movement Mortgage has all these programs. You guys correct, correct. Will... Yeah, we actually at Movement, we have a operations center in Virginia Beach. Okay. So when veterans come back, we actually have hired a lot of veterans to work uh, in our operations in different roles within the company, right. which, which is really neat, you know, kind of, not a, it's kind of hard for them when they come back in, in the transition piece and to be able to, uh, to offer some assistance. The uh, there. VA loan product, like Brian was saying, is oftentimes one that isn't known about. And your service is so appreciated um, by all of us and you know everyone. You really need to know that that is out there and take advantage of it because it is such a great product for you. So, um, And I've had veterans that literally are bringing almost nothing. I mean, right. even with closing right. costs, you know, we get the seller to pay for our closing costs. If your down payment was X amount of dollars and you're down, you know, you can literally come to the table. I've had some where they actually had to balance a little bit because they were actually supposed to get cash back, which you can't get cash back in yeah. closing. Um, but they had to balance some things out and then the veteran brought nothing right. to closing. It's such a great incentive for, for, for veterans, I think. so. Yeah, and I mean, there are easy ways to get a hold of that DD-214 if you need it. You can um, send out for a copy of it, which is going to take forever. Or I would always check the county recorder's office in the county that you live or in any county that you have lived in case you filed it there, where it can be filed for free. So weird that you would know that. It is so weird that I would know that, isn't it? <laughs> um, th one other thing, does movement do USDA loans? Yes. That's something else that I think is oftentimes a loan product that's not known about that is also such a great thing to take advantage of. Absolutely, because I was going to segue right into it. That's crazy, yes, I was going to go right into the USDA nice. because, it's of go. <laughs> because it's another 100% uh, no money down type of product. So with USDA, it's a little different. And how it's different is that the property itself actually has to be sitting in what's uh, called a USD plot map. So how that works is you can go to usd.gov, uh, type in the actual property search of the address, It'll pull up a geographical map and it'll say yes or no whether or not that property is eligible. So it's not based on the borrower, it's based off the home itself. Yeah, so the location of the home, which is great. So, you know, you have different pockets in Columbus and then on the outlining areas that USDA, you know, Marysville is a hotbed right now. Right. Um, and a lot of that still geographically is labeled under USDA. So there's a lot of opportunity for the 100%. When you get on the outlining outside of the Columbus Metro 270, uh -huh. there are pockets around that that are eligible still for USDA, which is great. Now, does USDA require the uh, additional ins inspections that um, FHA and VA require? So depending on if the, the, there could be a well in Suffolk. Mm -hmm. So if the property isn't in an actual city or they're not making, the, the homeowner's not making a payment to, let's say, the city of Columbus, mm -hmm. so you've got city water, at that point in time, yes, we'd like to have a well and septic done to make sure that the sampling of the water is sufficient. In terms of most inspections, 
they're not really required. It's more of a benefit to the buyer knowing what they're walking into with the home that they want to purchase. It's a major investment. You should always get a home inspection um, because if you're going to be spending that type of money, you need, need to know what's underneath the appearance to make <coughs> sure that, um, that your investment is going to be sound. Um, generally, with, with your FHA and your VA, unless it's, it comes back from the appraiser noting something, Generally, uh, the inspection piece is not required at all. Now, we have, to give you a scenario we had where, first time I've ever seen this in 16 years, an appraiser had noted on the concrete slab was cracked. And I've never seen in 16 years where we had to actually have the slab of the concrete fixed and have the appraiser go back mm -hmm. out. So that's a one-off mm -hmm. um, that can happen, which can throw a monkey wrench into the buyer, the seller, to you guys. Right. You know, uh, that could possibly delay the process um, because we, we had to send the, uh, the appraiser back out just to confirm that the work was complete. Um, but generally with your FHA, the big concern with that is that um, what, what I hear is, oh, it's not going to pass, it's not going to pass, I don't want to accept the VA or uh, an FHA buyer. Generally it's because of paint, right. where if the paint is, it is peeling or chipped, it's going to have to be... Uh, taken care of and you know there's there's a big misconception and FHA is a great product um, I think that the, the conception is still the old school ways where the appraisal is like a fine comb tooth inspection they've got to do their due diligence but they're just looking for to make sure that the property is sellable to the investor that will be insured and kind of going through and yes there's more cosmetic on obviously your, your VA or your, FHA, or your FHA appraisal is than a conventional um, but it's not nearly as, as detailed as it once was. Mm -hmm. so. so there's two instances I've noticed, you know, in my experience that have caused bigger issues with an FHA or a VA loan. And typically it seems to be older homes. And when I say older, I'm, you know, I'm talking, you know, pre 1930s, mm -hmm. you know, and even, you know, the 1978 lead based paint thing, you know, right. obviously we got to make sure there's no peeling paint, you know, children right. adjusting that and major health issues yeah. you know as a result um so the foundation paint um, those are the kinds of things that i've noticed that the appraiser is looking for when they go through and could but nine times out of ten these things are fixable you know so yeah but it's something i advise my my buyers that in the course of inspection and before we do a remedy request we're already looking for that stuff and trying to address it prior to the appraiser coming mm -hmm. out because what ends up happening is, is each time the appraiser comes out, then there's a fee that right. gets charged. And so, if it's a VA loan, the VA, you can correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, please, but the VA borrower is not allowed to pay for like those reappraisal fees, right? So like the seller would have to be the one that pays for yeah, like the re You're gonna need, you're gonna need the VA appraiser to be able to sign off mm -hmm. on the final report before I right. uh, can proceed. Right. So but he's right. I mean, paint is nine times out of ten. You know what I see is, is the big the big issue. Now, I had an FHA appraiser sign off on chipping paint, saying it was okay. The house was built in 1962, but the garage where the chipping paint was was built in 1985, <laughs> and we had the permit showing on the auditor's website. So he signed off and said it was okay, well, that's and everybody was happy. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I had a house built in 2000. I had a house built in 2000, and they still made them come back out That's and right. yeah. well, So it just depends on the appraisal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. appraisal is a whole other. Yeah. And, and that's it. We'll that's cover that one of these days too. <laughs> that, and that's hit and miss too. You just don't know because yeah. the any lending institution, uh, they don't control who's going out. So right. when uh, with what happened in, in 08, where I call the Wild Wild West, <clears> every major bank and, and, and broker, whoever in the lending industry, all uses a third-party vendor, which then they go out and send the assignment out to the appraiser. So back in the good old days when uh, I was cutting my teeth, you just pick up the phone and be yeah. like, hey, how you doing? I got an appraisal for you. And they would go out and, and take care of it. And this is how much I need. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I got no comment there. <laughs> Never no. have a copy of the contract, so they know. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, so, exactly. I got a, someone asked a question, right. and this is, this is where it may get a little like jumping around topics because this isn't anything to do with long time. But Debbie was asking, how do you use equity in your current home to put down on a new home? Mm. So, 
how do you use the equity? You would have to, in order to use it, you'd have to be selling your home. So how that would work is that if you're using these three great individuals right here for that next transaction, I don't know this name. Uh, when you go to sell a home, generally the title company that the listing agent is choosing for, for the transaction can give you what's called a preliminary CD. The CD will give you an estimate of what the, the fees are going to be associated with your side of the transaction selling it, and when um, fees, et cetera, et cetera, and then what, the, what would be left over based off of these Find individuals mm -hmm. doing their homework and pricing your home according to mm -hmm. what they can maximize the value for. So the equity piece then could be used towards the down payment on the new home that you want to purchase. Uh, and you don't have to use all of it. You know, for example, easy numbers. Um, you, it's a hundred thousand dollars, and you want to take ten percent of that and keep the rest. You know, you can use that amount and you know put a little bit down or put a lot down, or depending on what the equity stake is. But the equity in your home would be used once you actually list and you close. So you would close on your existing home first, mm -hmm. and then you would close on the new home right after that. Mm -hmm. And it can be done the same day. Yeah. So, so for us, the contingency part of this, you know, so it's like if you're going to use that equity, that the purchase of the new one has to be contingent on the sale of your home. If you're if you need the money right. and you can't qualify for the loan without closing the one, then it has to be contingent, and your realtor can help you. Mm -hmm. Navigate that part of the contract. Yeah, timing can be tricky sometimes. So, you know, that's a decision. But we can usually, you know, in the right situation, and it's, and it's not right in every situation. Yes, yeah. but it is done all the time. And to follow up to uh, Debbie's question, how that would be listed on your application is it's just equity of sale. Okay. So where your assets are, um, wherever you bank at, and you're listing the assets, it's just an extra added line that just says equity of sale, and then based off of the estimate that. Uh, Generally, the agents would have when they're doing the listing are going to give you that price point what they think you're going to be able to maximize when it's all said and done. From the lending side, we're going to ask that, hey, what did your agent say? What do you think your net's going to be? And then we can do the math to figure out what the actual equity is so we can show that as a uh, as what the down payment is going to be coming okay. from. Okay. Yeah. Going back to credit for a second, yes. everyone is always worried when they pull their credit report that everything counts the same. So are there certain things in someone's credit report, whether it's medical, bills, or past collections that may not count as much against them in the home buying process? Because in other areas, they will, things are weighted differently. So the, 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 that's an interesting question. I say this because the, the misconception is that a borrower, if they go to three or four different banks and have the banks pull their credit, it's going to plummet their scores. Right. Um, the credit reporting agencies do realize that home buyers and today's technology are going to be shopping, um, and it really doesn't give a hard impact to that actual credit score. Where you tend to see the, the credit scores drop is if I'm going into Lowe's and Home Depot and Target, and I'm trying to get store credit, and those credit inquiries, it, it looks like I'm desperate to the credit reporting mm -hmm. agencies, which can have a negative impact, which can actually drop your scores. Mm -hmm. Or I made a mistake, I'll, I'll be a real life example. Um, many years ago, I was uh, looking to buy a car, and I ordered a CarMax. And I didn't realize that when CarMax pulled my credit, it went out to like 20 different companies. Mm -hmm. And my credit was pulled, and I'm like, what just happened here? Oh, like, oh, oh, oh. That can have a massive dent on your credit mm -hmm. score right there. Um, so there is a difference between an actual home, a car, and credit cards with the inquiries and depending on what the borrower or the individual is trying to do to get the credit. But if you're looking to buy a mortgage, you know, I say three, four, you're good. Um, now if you're going out and having 10 to 15 lenders for your credit, it's going to drop. Um, the other thing that impacts credit scores is the availability balance of any credit cards that they currently have or credit. So if you have a line of credit that's a thousand and you have a balance that's at 900, your scores are going to drop because you don't really have a lot of um, room in there. So that's a little trick that we used to tell borrowers is that, hey, listen, if you pay your balances down to under 75%, it will actually help raise your scores up a little bit. You may be three or four months, depending on the availability of funds, to be able to do that before you can go start to buy. But there's little ways to work around trying to help the borrowers get. And we have a, uh, a scoring engine that if we had them pay down X, Y, and Z, um, we can actually get their scores to where we really need to be. So if you're 
if you're outside of the matrix um, and looking to buy, there's ways that you know most lenders can help you uh, get to that position to be able to buy. I think that's one of the things that we've been stressing too over the weeks that we've had these conversations too. That that just have that conversation with us. It, there's no obligation. Um, find out where you are with your credit score and what needs to be repaired. Obviously, Movement Mortgage has that ability um, to do that. Other lenders, I'm sure, can work with you on that as well. But it's important. If you don't know um, if you're lendable, you may be. If you think you're lendable, you may not be. So, you know, just open those doors and start to have those conversations and they can definitely guide you in the direction you need to go as far as, um, you know, where and what needs to be paid down and how. And so how does it impact you though? So say one person has a credit score of 580, you've mm -hmm. got another person at 640, and you've got another one at 720. How would those people, assuming all else fine from lendability standards, they just have a lower credit score, how does that impact them when you know the time comes and what their payments are going to be? Uh, risk. So the biggest thing credit score is, um, it has risk factor into it. So the lower the credit score, the higher the risk to the investor, which generally lower the credit score, higher the interest rate because of the risk to the investor. So if you're at a 720, your rate's gonna be a lot lower depending on the product and also depending on uh, the down payment that you're putting. So um, that would have one factor where on a, on a 580 borrower, you pretty much have one option um, and that would be FHA, um, unless you're a VA vet and um, you know, even at 580, that's considered high risk. So the rates are going to be higher just to the adjustment. Your, your middle of the score borrowers, um, which is generally where a lot of individuals fall into, pricing, um, once again, the higher the credit score that you have, the lower the rate is. That's just, it's, I don't know how to say this because I really don't work inside how pricing works, but just in the industry, it's almost kind of like a reward for having good credit because you're minimizing the risk to the investor. Um, because the scores indicate that you're able to pay your bills on time, um, you're able to manage payments and have a, um, a, a history, a past history of paying things on time, mm -hmm. which those that have the lower credit scores, things happen in life sure. um, where you know you, you can't control, you get behind and then or you have a medical collection that you're not aware of it and that can impact um, the credit score, which can drive you down into that lower bucket as well. But at the end of the day, it's about the rate, and the rate's based off of the assessment of the risk to the investor. Okay. I think a lot of the questions I often get are, what are rates, the credit score question, which, um, you know, it's, it, it's um, good information you're providing, for, I think, for everybody. But are rates different from bank to bank? Yes. Under, you know, yeah, generally they are. Um, we're all in the same bucket for mm -hmm. the most part. Um, it just depends on the institution or, you know, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this the right way. Um, certain institutions that I've been at in my career, depending on what they're holding in paper, mm -hmm. rates tend to be a little bit higher until they can unload that to the investors. Um, there's one particular place that I'll, I'll leave alone where when they had too much of that paper, the rates kind of went up to outprice. They were trying to eliminate getting that product on the books because they needed to uh, mm -hmm. unload it on the secondary market. It all depends. That's a, a finance question. Um, we've got each company has their own secondary department where they handle all the pricing sure. and their matrix sure. and what they need. And for me on my side, I can't really answer other than um, just a little bit of, of I knowing that certain products, yeah. the, the rates go up. But it just, it just all depends. Um, you know, some banks will advertise a low rate because they, they're trying to get volume in the door. Sure. You know, and other banks have too much volume and the rates go up a little bit to kind of control that that product sure. as well. So it's, it's a hard question, honestly, to answer um, because they do vary. Generally, for the most part, though, you're, you're talking maybe a quarter. Yeah, um, not, not significant. Not, not significant, you know, a quarter, so four, four and a quarter, uh, depending on the product, loan to value, borrower, right. there's different factors. That come and what's the difference in interest rate and APR? Generally, the, the APR has what's built into uh, finance cost. So the APR shouldn't, on a purchase transaction, be that much higher than what the actual interest rate is. Um, now, when you get into a refinance and you see that the APR is very high, 
Now you should be concerned because there's fees associated with that rate, which in today's world with the closing disclosure, formerly known as a HUD or settlement statement, um, all that information has to be disclosed, which can skew the APR. Um, and with the loan estimate, the new LE that rolls out, it's breaking all that down. So the APR initially disclosed looks a lot higher than what typically it is. It shouldn't be that much different than what the actual um, rate itself is, unless there's actually origination charges to, to, the, to the borrower. Going back to the very beginning yeah. of the process, if I'm getting ready to buy a house and I'm all excited, what should I have together before I ever come see you so that we can make this a quick and smooth process? Because so many people go in and they're just like, hey, I thought I'd bring in a couple check subs, and then the lender money? said that all of a sudden they want all this other information. Why do they want this? This would be an example too. <laughs> so that's a great question. So what we like to have borrowers when they're coming in and they're speaking with us, you know, it is a month worth of pay stubs. Most borrowers get paid twice a month, so that would be two paychecks. Uh, two months worth of bank statements, all pages. What we find a lot is that there's a fifth page or an eighth page that's always blank, still need it. Um, <laughs> if they're W-2 employees, then the last two years of their W-2s. And um, with the bank statements, just trying to figure out where, where, their, where their down payment's coming from. So some borrowers will liquidate a 401k. So those are questions that a loan originator up front before they schedule that meeting or asking different questions to the borrower to have them be prepared to bring in that documentation. But if your basics would be your pay stubs, your W-2s, your bank statements, if you're self-employed, um, your tax returns, uh, your 1040s, not your state, so your federal tax returns for the last two years. Um, and then you know the bank statements, that gives us a big piece of what we need that the underwriter is gonna look for um, when, when they're going to be submitting the loan. Um, the one thing that we do differently than our competition is that we like submitting the file to an underwriter right up front. So before you go out and actually start showing your buyer's homes, you actually, we can do the, do the review by an underwriter and be able to issue out what's called a loan commitment. So we actually want our buyers to know what they owe before you guys go out and show them. So that's a huge advantage that's not really going on in the market right now. Um, and those are things to answer your question uh, back to just two, uh, two pay stubs, month worth of pay stubs, uh, W-2s for the last two years, and the last 60 days with your bank statements uh, would be the, the basics that we would need to get the ball rolling. And what are maybe the two or three things that I shouldn't do once you've given me that pre-approval letter? Go buy a car. <laughs> <laughs> do not go buy a car. Don't go buy any large transaction. Don't buy anything. Don't go over no, no, financial lockdown. Don't go on financial lockdown. No. Don't go opening new credit cards. Yes. And stuff like that. So, don't close them either. Yeah, don't yeah. close credit cards either. That, that's a misconception that we see a lot of that um, consumers are advised, hey, pay off the card and then close out. It actually has a negative impact uh, or could have a negative impact on your credit scores, which if you went through uh, the process up front or you're in process to buy a contract, meaning that you're in the process, and you go get new debt, it could drop your scores, which then you may not be eligible to get the financing all over something that could have waited until after the loan was actually closed. So don't go do anything. Listen to your, your listen to these guys and, and your loan officer. And those guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, that, I can't stress that enough. I mean, I think where things seem to go bad and things happen is people are, are not open and aren't communicating throughout the course of the transaction. Right. And I guess just know that if you, you know, I guess it's, what is it, the the law of physics or whatever, you know, where, you know, there's an equal and opposite impact for everything that you do. And so it's like, if you go open a credit card or you go buy a car, just know that that's going to affect you. If you're going to do something with your finances, like you get a new job, um, you change jobs, you make less money, you make more money, you know, those things can impact you too. So. You just said something. Don't change jobs in the middle of the process yeah. either. <laughs> because that can happen and that's something that if you know that you're actively looking to make a career change, let your let everyone involved in the transaction, especially the finance guy, the loan officer that's handling the transaction, 
you need to be aware that 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 that's a deal killer right there. <clears throat> Uh, depending on what the scenario is. I've had buyers who have um, started looking and then they say, well, I just changed jobs. So what about before they get pre-approved? Is there time then? Is it, how does that all work? It, it depends on the line of business. So it, you still can get financing. Um, it, you need, we want to see a two-year history. So that's a good point that when we talked about pay stops, well, what's a time history? Two years on the job is is what we're looking for. Um, so if, for example, let's say that um, it's me mm -hmm. and I'm in sales and I'm an originating, right? So I'm deciding to go somewhere else and I'm going to buy a house. As long as, well, I'm different because that, that's a bad analogy. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's say that I work as a W-2 employee and... Um, Let's say you work for the state. Yes. And I'm just changing. I'm going from the state that's W-2, but it's still a state. Like IT. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good that's a good field. Where I work for the state IT and now I'm going over to a lender just because it's on top of my head right now and I'm doing an IT. It's still the same line of business. It's a different employer, but it's still the same work, which you're going back in a W-2. Generally, what we'd like to see is a minimum of one pay sub at the new employer. Um, if an offer letter that helps uh, the underwriters see that, hey, this is what the income that they're gonna be getting for the year uh, with that transition. One thing that will never, that, that's not good is when a borrower is W-2 and then decides to become self-employed. Uh, because with a self-employed borrower, you need two years of actual federal tax returns to show, um, to get qualified off of that. So if you're, W-2, and then in the going to self-employed, you're gonna to have to wait two years to be able to get the financing for a mortgage after the second year when you file your taxes, when they those returns. And that's, I'm the example there. So I just bought a house last October. Um, you know, I've been in the business for a while, had done it part-time for a while. So I had W-2 and 1099 income on my uh, returns. Mm -hmm. So I had to wait until I had two years of only 1099 mm -hmm income to be able to to buy a home um does that is that generally the same for all investors? yeah that, that, that's investor those are investor guidelines yeah. so um that that's something where you get into different investors have what's called overlays to minimize the risk or pat, extra layers added to the risk to, for qualifications but with your scenario that's standard across the board yeah. mm -hmm. okay um, I feel like there's so much we could talk about this, and we've been talking we've a couple a long time. questions. Here Do you, yeah, I mean, no, I've got one too. So, is, or is it the um, same? So, the one piggybacks off the other. So, we, we've addressed the one kind of, but we could go back into it just briefly. She asked, um, if you get pre-qualified, how does it affect your credit? And then asks, how do you go about finding the best rates, or should I, or how do I go about finding the best rates or the best lender? So, we'll use those back to back. Well, certain lenders, does it impact your score once you get pre qualified No. Generally, the majority of the institutions out there right now that are doing lending practices is that they'll pull credit, they'll ask you for what your income is, they're going to take that verbally, good loan officers will actually ask for the documentation, and then they're just going to issue out what's called a letter. So the credit report is good for 90 days. Um, after 90 days in the process, it needs to be repulled. Uh, re so, to impact your credit, it's not going to impact your, pre your credit. You're going to have a letter that the ink's probably worth more than the paper itself mm -hmm. um, because it's just based off of a loan officer who's a sales guy that um, is looking at, yeah, this makes sense, my ratios are in line, yeah, I'm good to go and, and issue out the paper or the, the letter, the pre qual letter. So to piggyback off the rates, it all depends on your credit score, um, the product, and, and what you're looking. So. You know, it, it's one of those where most everyone's going to be in competition. For me, it's not about rate, it's about service. Um, and, and I say that because you can get the lowest rate and you could have the worst service or you could be 60 days before you close and you're going to pull out the hair out of your head because it's just a nightmare and is it really worth an eighth or a quarter, which it's not all about rate, it's about the payment and is $5 or $10, depending on the loan amount, really worth that frustration of the financing or would you like to actually have a smooth transaction where you're, you're, you're done sooner than later because it is a stressful time in your life and there's a lot of factors that go involved and, and just 
You know, to answer your question, finding someone that you're comfortable with, finding someone that everyone should have, you know, integrity and honest. To be honest, that's not the reality, though. There are individuals out there that, you know, uh, that, that just don't play in that sandbox. So for me, if I'm shopping, yeah, rate is important, but it's also who's the company? What's the service like? Do I feel comfortable with the individual that's handing the finances? Because I think at the end of the day, you're working with them and you've got to have the trust and the agents that you're working with, they work with certain lenders, they can recommend them based off of the trust piece that they have. You know, they can't necessarily say, hey, you gotta use this guy, they can't by law. They've got to recommend different names, you know, a couple different names for that. But generally they're working with that loan officer for a reason and they're always a good piece of uh, a starting point as well from a reference because these guys do this day in and day out they know who the good apples are in the market. They know who the bad apples are in the market. They're not going to work with the bad apples because at the end of the day, you're their client as well. And it, it's about trust and being able to deliver and making the experience a good one for all parties involved. So sometimes the rate might be a slightly higher depending on your loan amount. Sometimes rate doesn't even matter. Right. Um, you know, and it just, it's all case by case. So it can't really, hopefully that's, that's good enough to, to answer that question. Oh, I think so. I say, I, yeah. I say start with your agent. Yeah. You know, if you don't know someone, ask your agent. And then also, you know, social I think is great. Post mm -hmm. it on Facebook. Talk right. to your friends, talk to your family. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's got it. You know, tons of people usually they're connected to on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever your social media mm -hmm. du jour is. You know, go ask those people. Ask people who they've used. Yeah. Ask people who you trust. And find out, but I, you know, generally, I think your agent has a bank of people that we, you know, we work with. Yeah. Obviously, Brian is yeah. one of those people, and we've kept them in our circle because they've done a good job for our past, mm -hmm. our past clients. So, um, and Steve Nixon, I saw was on there earlier. He's also from Movement Mortgage. If he's still on there, I'll put a plug in for Steve. But looks looks like Travis from your office is on. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> he's, well, he's helping answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> He's also for movement, and I told him he should write a question and put you under the gun. Nice. Like, <laughs> and he said, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I'm actually surprised some of my peers across the, the country aren't chiming in right now. Anyone? Uh, yeah, no, hey, don't, don't. Raffle! No. <laughs> Here they go. That's, that's, oh, that's what I was going to do. Question. <laughs> no. So, and then, okay. They're busy. They're obviously, busy. one of they the awkward right, things. Yeah about Facebook Live is we get like the highs and the comments and um, there were a little comments about the hair I've got going today sporting Bradley Blue. I've got a wrestling tournament I have to go to this week. <laughs> well, I don't have to. I'm sporting the boy child obviously in his sport du jour and um, it's wrestling and I'm not dressed for it because I'm going right from here to there and so go Jags. <laughs> Hometown boys, yes. Yes, yeah. So, um, and that's a Darby if anybody wants to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Five o'clock, starts at five. <laughs> a little ride going on tonight. Yeah, it's not ready. Yeah. So, um, gosh, there's so much with lending. I mean, there's just, I, I feel like we have scratched the surface of it, and I would love to have you back again. Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, one yeah. last, do we have like two minutes? Sure. Yeah, yeah we, 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 with, with different products, we didn't get into. You also have a conventional loan, so uh, there's two different products out there. They're called Home Ready and Home Possible. One's Fannie, one's Freddie. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to complicate that, but it's three yeah. percent down. So that's something oh, sorry, where three percent okay. down. Okay. So it's actually I like it better than FHA, just because the mortgage insurance is at a discounted rate, and it can get a buyer in for three as opposed to three and a half percent. And is yeah. that one word will eventually fall off or yes. are they stuck with that? No, it, it, it's a conventional loan. Okay. So over time, if they stay in the property and the equity is built in, that, that would actually fall off and it's at this this kind of rate. Um, we could do a whole segment just on the different, what to look for. But I just wanted to well, mention, we we just, <laughs> I just wanted to mention that because that is some alternative, you know, bond programs yeah. that offer grants. Uh, you've got Addy, you've got, uh, uh, o5 you have uh, heroes there's just different uh, programs out there to kind of help the first time home buyer you know your best of your first time home buyer is to find a USDA if you're not a veteran because you've got the hundred percent now you need a credit score of 620 or higher for that is that income qualifying too yes it is okay. so it's based off of the county limits of the income uh, so there the USDA has 
a, a chart for us not smart people where we can kind of see what, <laughs> what, what the max income is or what the average or the median income is in that county and the, the borrower can't exceed that. Okay. If they exceed that, then they're not eligible for, uh, for USDA financing, which USDA on their site is also has another link where you can actually type in your income and it can let you know whether or not you're qualified based off that. So, you know, the government agencies, they're working, they want buyers, um, obviously, and, you know, it, it's just something that there are other products than just what we talked about. And I just wanted to kind of mention those because there are no, other, absolutely, other yeah. options out there as well for your buyers. It tends to be a conversation and we jump from topic to topic to topic. So yeah, definitely bring up anything at this point. Well, I mean, I think a good loan officer, you know, um, in the investigation of your finances and your situation, you know, these things come up, right? Absolutely. And so then yeah. your loan officer, just as much or more than your agent, you know, you lean on them for the expertise and to find out what is best for you because what works for Jenny or TJ, you know, um, or Brian doesn't necessarily work for me. So, you know, or something works better. And in the end, if you can, you know, I know a quarter of a percent or, you know, if you, if you're able to put more down and all of these things that factor in, if you plan to stay somewhere long term, that stuff adds up yeah. to money. Um, and you know, maybe you can retire an extra year early if, you, if, you're, if you're wise about how you do this stuff. So, um, but in any case, you know, just talk to the people that you've involved in this process. And I think that's, that's a key theme that, that carries through each of these conversations that we've had is, you know, you don't have to know everything. And I think that's one of the things I, I sense the anxiety of people that come to me is they feel overwhelmed by the process because they, they think they need to know every last thing. You don't need to necessarily know everything. It's good to know and educate yourself, but I think it's even better to have people that are smarter than you in, in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes so. two people just don't know what they don't know. So they right. feel like they should be coming to the table with all these questions and, and you just don't have them. Right. And that comes back to the few higher trustworthy people. Yeah. Um, and you again find those people through the people you trust. Um, then you don't have to worry as much about someone taking advantage of you because in the end we're all in a referral business. You know, that's you know, and if I do a bad job or Brian does a bad job, you know, you're not gonna type in when someone asks on Facebook who's a good lender or who's a good realtor because you we did you wrong. And right. that's never my goal, but you know I, I Right. So Well was, we all know we're coming I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> we're we're coming to the table with that reputation. I mean mm -hmm. real estate agents and lenders don't you know, the, the, the occupation doesn't have, um, you know, everyone thinks we're shady for some reason. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because there are people out there that give us a bad That name. we're shady. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they were shady. <laughs> or weren't honest, or maybe come off as trying to be that way, and I don't think that, um, you know, most of us are not. I mean, we're right. genuine and trying to do the best for you that we can. So. Yes. So. Anything else anybody wants to chime in here before we... Well, I think before we wrap up, yeah, we have to ask all of our little Facebook Live people to wish oh, you a happy no. birthday. Because I wondered why you got up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't to shut I us down. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to say because we would lose viewership. But Lane's going to be 29. I don't know. Wait a minute. Do you, do you sing? Do you sing? I, I, I never <laughs> sing in the world, but I'll start off with one. Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> We can do the Gigi song. We haven't had that song yet. We need a Gigi song. Tune back in one hour. That won't go live. We'll sing anything. Then it'll be karaoke. Facebook live. Look, we started. Oh, look, I'm getting happy birthday. Oh, 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 oh. You said something about singing and then the number of people who were turning in, like, left. Like, yeah, like, it looked like you were just like in the tank. So. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you and everybody for again, you know, tuning in and we'll be back again same time next week. Mm -hmm. So next week we're going to have a title person in to talk mm -hmm. with us, Amy from World Class Title. And, um, Lots of people are on for World Class. Yeah, yeah, that's always an issue too. I, I think that that's one of those mysterious things that you get in the transaction mm -hmm. and you're talking to someone from the title company and, and the seller's talking to someone from the title company, but what does that mean? Exactly. And do I really need title insurance? Do we do title insurance? <laughs> I mean, I'm already buying homeowner's insurance and a home warranty. What's and this all other this thing? Stuff. What yeah. is that stuff? What are these fees? What, <laughs> what does that all mean? So, will you come back? 
I would love to come back. I, I'm well, grateful for you guys having me here. And anyone cool. that has any further questions or would like um, Movement Mortgage uh, contact information, you know we're here. You know yeah. how to reach us. Mm -hmm. so. so it's movementmortgage.com, is that correct? Or yeah, so you can go to uh, you go to movementmortgage.com, you can go to movementmortgage.com backslash brian.sumption. Um, my phone number is 614-361-8407. Uh, I'll help assist you, answer any questions. Um, I'm here to help and that's why I love what I do is to watch people get in their homes. Brian's a good guy and we appreciate you being here. Yes. And, uh, of course you can find us at 43.homes.com. You can you know, message us privately. You know, yes. Any of our friend walls here if you have other questions or post them in the comments. Or not screen. so private, just, <laughs> we'll, just message us. <laughs> we'll answer those too and we'll draw winners from the, the questions that were asked here. So again, thank you everybody. We'll hope to see you Thanks, back next guys. week. Thank you. Bye. Bye everybody. See ya. Cheers. Peace out. Cheers. Oh, <laughs> cheers. <laughs>